Good day everyone and welcome to season 2 episode 3 of IVSA Kelantan podcast show. Today's topic is veterinary oral care, anesthesia free dental procedures. So allow me to introduce our speaker for today. With us now is Dr. Amy Thompson, who is a boarded veterinary dentist and oral surgeon. After completing a three-year dentistry and oral surgery residency at the University of Wisconsin Medicine, Dr. Amy Thompson puts her new knowledge and experience to use in a referral hospital in Toronto. She is based in Ontario, Canada, and she is also a veterinarian at Thompson Mobile Veterinary Dentistry. In regards to our topic of the day, dental care for animals is vital for their overall health and well-being. With that said, there is a need to create awareness and understanding among pet owners as well as veterinary students. At the moment, there is a lack of exposure towards veterinary dentistry in Malaysia as compared to other countries. So today, we have the amazing Dr. Amy Thompson, who is a specialist in this field, to help us with our efforts in implementing veterinary dentistry in our dictionary. So the first question for you, Dr. Amy, is what inspired you to pursue veterinary dentistry? Yeah, so thank you very much for having me. Passion for dentistry started when I was a family veterinarian. wasn't fully prepared for this, so I started doing a bunch of online courses um, and going to lectures at conferences. And the more I learned, the more I was interested in it. So when I started bringing that knowledge back to my clinical practice and my patients, I was you know, having owners say to me, oh my gosh, I was just getting such positive feedback from owners that didn't realize that their pets had any oral pain, um, other than me telling them, you know, it looks like this mouth is painful. And a lot of them were a little bit suspicious, um, but they trusted me. And fortunately, they trusted me and allowed me to anesthetize their pet um, and do full exams and x-rays. And then um, oftentimes we would find disease that we weren't certain of when they were awake. And then the biggest change they noticed was not in the development of that disease, but once I had removed that discomfort. Um, and so it was just very fulfilling and satisfying to know that I was making such a difference. Um, and so then that just kind of fueled my passion to learn more and to do more. And then after about four years as a um, family veterinarian or general um practice practitioner, I decided to take the leap, um, pick up my things and move to another country um, and do my residency. Thank you so much for the explanation on how you are inspired to pursue this field in veterinary medicine. So our next question will be coming from June. Okay, doctor. Um, so for me, my question would be, um, could doctor briefly explain to us your journey in veterinary dentistry? Yeah, absolutely. So I didn't know I wanted to be a dentist. I wanted to be a small animal um, family veterinarian. So from sort of a medium sized town, and I've been working in clinics since I was like, probably beginning of high school, sort of knew I want to be a veterinarian since when, when I was a kid. And I had a um, sort of very focal vision of what I wanted. And that was what I'd been exposed to. Um, and that was being a family veterinarian for primarily cats and dogs, so um, companion animals. And so when I got into vet school, that was sort of my goal. At the end of the day, um, I really wanted to have that sort of um, relationship um, with being a family veterinarian. And so uh, I kind of stuck to that path. I did actually do sort of a, a mixed animal stream in my clinical year. So um, technically, I was a food animal student because I wanted to work with cows or do bovine medicine. So I did a lot of bovine um uh, electives and then our, our core courses and my electives were small animal. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, where I was looking geographically, there weren't mixed animal jobs. So um, I stuck with what I was most confident and competent in, which was small animal. And then, like I said, I really started to learn uh, about dentistry once I was a veterinarian. And the more I learned, the more I really enjoyed it. Um, I started going to the North American um, conference each year 
Uh, and so it was meeting new people and gaining new knowledge. And that's where I met my dentistry mentor. Uh, and so I got to spend more time shadowing him and, you know, doing more um, periodontal cases, feeling more confident. And uh, after a few years, he was like, you know, you really should consider doing a residency. And, um, you know, for a while, I kind of hemmed and hawed because I liked that um, family practice um, where I got to really know my patients and my clients. I got to see them each year. But ultimately, end of the day, I just wanted to just do dentistry. And so probably about 70 to 80 percent of my um, work was doing uh, dentistry. And so it made sense to kind of take that um, step uh, towards becoming a board certified dentist and focusing exclusively on that. So it was like the support and encouragement of people that I'd met um, going to conferences and in that community that really kind of gave me the little nudge I needed to go and to do that. I see. Um, that's pretty interesting for me. And now I'll pass on the questions to JJ. So for the third question uh, is from me. So what is your stand? on anesthesia-free dental procedure and would you mind to elaborate more on what comes under this category when it's discussed in clinic, clinic practitioners? Yeah, absolutely. So very strongly opposed to doing any sort of dental care without anesthesia. And so initially, um, I think that these became popular because of owner's fear of anesthesia. And so, you know, just to be very upfront, an anesthesia is not a benign therapy or treatment. There's definitely risk associated with anesthesia. However, the risks associated with anesthesia are very, very low um, for a healthy patient. And then even those patients that do have a comorbidity, so say a heart murmur um, indicating potentially heart disease, um, maybe an older pet that has some renal insufficiency. So there's that portion of it of I, I believe that's where this came from is trying to avoid the risks of anesthesia. The issue is without anesthesia, you cannot appropriately diagnose or treat any oral condition. So while you're avoiding the risk of anesthesia, you're taking on a whole host of risk of not actually treating any disease. So in Ontario, in Canada, where I'm, I am, there have to be called cosmetic cleanings because there was a Supreme Court ruling because of so many pets ending up with having significant disease or having complications um, that it was a ruling to say we need to let pet owners know that these these are cosmetic. And so for me, there's no health benefit. Like that's what that means to me. If it's truly cosmetic, it means the teeth are looking better, but they're no healthier. And so to really diagnose disease, we need to be just like when you and I go to the dentist, we need to probe around each individual tooth to feel for any deep pocketing, any attachment loss. And then we also need to take x-rays. So we can only examine half of a tooth. And unlike you and I, where our dentist can say, you know, do you have any sensitivity? Is that bothering you? Obviously, our pets can't tell us if they have sensitivity. So we rely very heavily on x-rays to look inside of the tooth and along the roots. And there's lots of literature to see, to, sorry, to note that we miss probably anywhere between 50 and 70% of disease that's present when we're not taking x-rays. And so again, unlike you and I, where we'll sit and hold the little dental x-ray plate in our mouth, even the best dogs or cats will not sit still for that. And so if we're not doing that tooth by tooth exam, and those x-rays, we really have no idea how significant or severe that disease is. So if we can't find it, we most certainly can't treat it. And then even if we find it, and let's say it's really diseased tooth, it's wiggly, um, you can see that on a wake exam, we know that tooth needs to come out, we don't know... Um, uh, if we fully got the tooth out, did we get all the disease out? And it's just not appropriate to be doing any of that treatment for multiple reasons. So to remove a tooth that is uncomfortable, right? For us, we're going to get a nerve block. 
We absolutely can't do a nerf walk in an awake patient. There's no way they're going to sit still while we poke them with a needle, not to mention the level of fear they're going to experience. Um, so doing any surgery obviously is a no-go. Um, however, even quote unquote, just cleaning. And I don't like the word just because it makes it seem like it's not super important. Um, but cleaning is really important. So with early stage disease, doing a cleaning without doing any sort of quote unquote surgery, that's actually treating disease, but we can't fully clean the two surface because some of that surface is below the gum line. And again, even the best behaved patient, we can't have them sit still enough to get underneath the gum line. So these cleanings, cosmetic cleanings that are being done without anesthesia is we're cleaning just the surface we can see. And again, that's cosmetic. The teeth look cleaner and healthier, but we're not getting the disease below the gum line. And the other thing is significant risk. So those instruments are sharp because we need to be able to remove that calculus. And so we can cause, and that is what happened in some of these poor cases, is that they ended up with significant lacerations in their mouth and their gum because they move. They're not predictable, right? So for the pet's safety, for their peace of mind so they're not fearful, and then for us being able to truly diagnose and treat that disease, they do need to be under anesthesia to do all of those things. And so while there is no completely risk-free anesthesia, we can work with the pet owner with doing blood work. Maybe we do chest x-rays. Maybe they get an ultrasound of the heart um, to kind of know how severe the disease is. And then we can decide what kind of drugs we're using. Um, depending on the type of heart disease, there's drugs we can do to help the heart instead of suppressing it. If they've got renal issues, we can be giving, you know, more fluids before, during, and after. So there's lots of things that we can do to mitigate the risk. Um, and if the pet has oral disease that warrants treatment, most times I would say there's maybe a truly maybe a handful of patients in my entire career of about 10 years where the risk of anesthesia was higher than the benefit of treatment. So generally speaking, tens of thousands of pets, their benefit from this procedure under anesthesia is much higher than that small risk. All right. Thank you for your sharing. That, that, that's very interesting. So for the next question, I will pass to uh, Jaya. Hi, doctor. So my next question would be, um, in your professional opinion, what are the challenges that, uh, that are faced by oral surgeons when they approach a case in a clinic? Because we're, we're dealing with teeth, which is something very small. Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, um, very small. So my mentor always used to say, if you're dealing with a dog, you have 42 tiny patients. So each individual tooth is a patient now um, and they're really tiny. And so in order to treat these tiny patients, we have to be able to see them well. So my biggest thing I will say to all um, veterinarians and surgeons is being able to see well means having magnification. So all of my surgery I do from cleanings to extractions to endodontic procedures to big oral surgeries, I'm always using loops. So with some magnification and light, even with an overhead light, trying to get that light exactly in the back of the mouth where you're looking is really hard unless you have a light source sort of like a headlamp or a light source with your loops, light and magnification are the biggest things that are going to make your job much easier and enjoyable is when you can really see what you're doing. So it's going to help with your cleaning and your diagnostics as well as your actual surgery. So, um, my recommendation is to consider looking into having loops in the clinic. Um, certainly there's a cost associated with those. However, when you're first starting, there are lots of loop options where they are adjustable so you can move the loops. So that helps keep costs down if it's shared throughout the clinic. Now I have my own kind of fancy pair um, because I'm using them all day. So I have them specific with my prescription and my pupil distance and the exact magnif magnification that I like. Um, so that is a huge help is just really being able to see your tiny little patients you're dealing with. All right. Thank you so much, doctor. So the next question will be 
given to you by Natalia. All right, doctor. So the question for me is, what advice would doctor usually give to pet owners in terms of their pet's dental health? Yeah, great question. So really important to talk to owners about this. Um, and so I normally will gauge the owner. So the absolute best thing that our pet owners can do for our pets is brush their teeth. They're like, I know it sounds crazy. Trust me, I used to think it was a little bit too too. It is the gold standard, right? Like that's why we brush our teeth multiple times a day. It's the same with our pets. And so um, no, they're ancestors way, 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 way back hundreds of years ago were in the wild and they didn't have their teeth brushed, but those pets only live to be about three, four or five years old, right? And we want our pets to live much longer. And so in order to do that, we need to keep them healthy. So tooth brushing is the absolute best thing that they can be doing. Um, so one, there's nothing better at controlling plaque. And if we don't have plaque, we can't have calculus. So we're basically really starting at the source. The other thing is, is dogs that have food allergies. We don't need to worry about them being allergic to a different diet or treat because you can even brush without toothpaste, just the, the bristles of a brush. The other thing is obesity is a big problem in our pets. And so giving them a chew or a kibble or something every day is going to add calories, no calories with tooth brushing. And then the final thing is, is that Cavities have not been reported in cats and they're extremely rare in dogs, unlike with humans. So unlike with us where, you know, we want to brush our teeth after we eat because we don't want to risk cavities with dogs and cats, we can brush their teeth and then feed them. So this can really, you know, they're smart you know, that if I sit still for this toothbrushing that I don't love, I get a special treat or I get a bowl full of food um, and you'll find that their tolerance for it will increase steadily if we get into that habit. So I find it's more of making it a habit, right? So it's something we want to do every day. Um, and with any habit, whether it's with pet care, our own care, you know, whatever it is, it takes about three weeks to get into that cycle. So my biggest thing for owners is I just say, like, when are you kind of more relaxed or hanging out? You've got time. Like, when can this happen? If you've got a busy morning. You've got kids to get to school. You've got a partner to get to work, lunches to make. Morning's not going to work. But in the evenings, if you tend to have downtime, then maybe that's the best time to do it. And what I did when I first started brushing my dog's teeth is I would just leave her a little toothbrush on the vanity. So at night, I'd go brush my teeth and then be like, well, there's her toothbrush. So just reminding me to become a habit. So making sure it's happening every day. She got a special treat before bed after her teeth, teeth were brushed. And then the final thing is when owners will say, oh, I've tried and it doesn't work. I'll say, okay, well, what wasn't working? And nine times out of 10, the owner will say, well, they were chewing on the toothbrush. And that tells me that they were brushing their dog or cat's teeth like they, we brush our own, which makes sense, right? We we do what we already know. So we're going to brush our pet's teeth like we brush our own. So they're going to get in all the nooks and crannies and brush in all the surfaces. And the thing is, is no one really enjoys brushing the inside surfaces of their teeth because, you know, your tongue's in the way. And especially a pet, you've got something in their mouth. They're like, no way. Like their gag reflex. They're like, get this thing out of my mouth. So then I know that that owner's been brushing that way. And I'm like, huh. Here's my other trick. I actually recommend when we first teach our pets and our pet owners to brush is I actually encourage them to just very gently hold their pet's mouth closed so they can keep their teeth clenched. And then I just brush the outside surfaces. So then they're not annoyed by having this toothbrush in their mouth and they're chewing on it, trying to get rid of it. I just very gently hold their mouth closed and then I just slide the toothbrush in the cheek pouch and just brush the outside surfaces. And then once they get used to that, we can potentially build up to brushing the inside surfaces, but some dogs and cats just aren't going to have that. And what I would say is I would very confidently say I would much rather my pet owners brush the outside surfaces of their pet's teeth every single day than brush all the surfaces every couple of weeks. Because the thing is, is 
the plaque that builds up is a film that wraps around the entire tooth. So if you're removing only on the outside, you're still thinning that film on the inside. So you're still having benefit benefit on the other surfaces of the teeth. And if you can get rid of that film, then it can't be calcified into calculus or tartar that can't be removed. So those are my main, I guess, three tips is one, pick a time and a place where you can stick to doing it every single day. Reward them with treats. Um, you can feed them treats or a meal after, and then encouraging them to hold their mouth, mouth, their pet's mouth closed. Not hard, just very light pressure to keep their little, um, so kind of over their nose, under their chin, to keep their teeth clenched so that the toothbrush isn't bothering them. And it's just on the outside surfaces. And I find with those steps, the compliance with owners is much, much higher. And then, of course, we can do more, right? So toothbrushing is the best thing we can do, but that doesn't mean we can't do other things. So like dental diets, dental chews, and then all of that, the owner is going to do at home 364 days of the year. And then one day a year, they're going to come and see us and we're going to put their pet under anesthesia and we're going to clean up anything that gets missed and just going to make sure that we do a nice deep clean clean same as you and I like I brush multiple times a day I floss but there's still stuff to be cleaned when I go see my dentist once a year and in doing that we're basically each year if they can do most of the work the other 365 Four, that one day I'm going to reset. And if we can ideally see patients where we don't have any significant bone loss, but we're starting to get some inflammation of the gums and we've got some calculus to clean. If we clean that, we actually treat that disease and we actually reverse disease, which is really cool. As veterinarians, we don't often get to reverse disease. Once it's there, we manage it. So I think it's pretty neat that if we can get our pet owners on board with us to be doing kind of the home care and then coming to see us once a year, we can keep that mouth really healthy. Um, and while it is each year anesthesia, the anesthetic is much shorter, therefore much less risk of complication if we're cleaning and not having to clean and then do a bunch of extractions. It also is going to be less cost if we're not doing all that oral surgery. So overall, this is for me is like a win, win, win for everybody. All right, doctor. Thank you so much for the answer. So the next question will be coming from June. All right. Thank you, Natalia. So um, doctor, um, for my question is, what set of skills do you incorporate into paving your pathway to become a dentist? Great question. So a lot, there's a lot of different skills. I would say one of the biggest ones that maybe doesn't get talked about much as much is client communication. So I find with dentistry, because unlike, let's say that they hurt their paw or their leg, they're going to limp and the owner's really going to see that. Or if they've got allergies and they're really itchy, the owner's going to see that. But oftentimes with a, with a dog or cat, if they have one sore tooth, they often aren't going to stop eating. They're just going to eat on the opposite side. So if anyone here has been, is like any of you or anyone listening has had a sore tooth, we still eat. <laughs> and so that's what I'll tell owners. So I still eat. I still drink. Drink. I still go to the bathroom, I still go to work, but I'm going to complain about that tooth hurting. And that's the thing is like, you know, sounds kind of cheeky and cliche, but our pets can't communicate with us. And so if we wait for the pet to stop eating, we know that they're in serious trouble. Whereas the subtlety of, um, them choosing to chew on one side versus the other. I mean, I don't sit. Well, I did sit and watch my pet eat sometimes because I wanted to make sure. But most pet owners are feeding their pet and then we're evaluating, are they eating or are they not? They're not sitting there going, which side are they chewing with? right? And so in fact, I've had owners where I say, you know, this tooth is sore, I can see it's fractured, it's got more calculus on it than the other side. So I know that your pet is sore over here, because you've got more plilled up of calculus, because they're not using that side. And the owner, I've had owners say, you're wrong. And I say, okay, that's fine. They don't believe me. But 
every single one of those owners where I've been able to show them what we call asymmetrical calculus within a couple days has called back to say, you know, you're right. They're only chewing on one side. So education and having that communication with owners is really helpful. Um, I also think that it's hard because like owners love their pets. They care about their pets. So if they think their pet is healthy and then you tell them they have this big problem, sometimes that can be, they can be offended, right? Because they're like, I know my pet. If they were painful, I would know. And so I will just acknowledge with them that like your, your pet isn't complaining, because for them to really complain, they'd have to stop eating. And if they stop eating, then now they're hungry, right? So it's not your fault that you don't know. Like, that's why you're coming to see me. I'm the one that's supposed to find problems in the mouth and catch them before they're so painful that they stop eating or they're hiding from you or they're not willing to play and things like that. So I would say, I mean, there's lots of surgical skills that are going to be really important in dentistry and oral surgery. However, I think one of the most important things is being able to to relate to your pet parents, your owners, and communicate what you're finding and just let them know that there's no, there's no shame. There's no, you know, guilt in the fact that if they didn't find this problem, I mean, that's our job, right? Like us as a veterinarians are supposed to find these, hopefully we don't find problems and we don't want to find them, but if they're there, we want to find them and, and let the owner know what we can do. Um, to, to fix that problem. And then once we fix that problem, you know, say we see them and they've got a lot of disease and we have to take out a bunch of teeth, then I really like to focus on, okay, so here's things we can do now. So we can't go back in time. We can't save these teeth that are so diseased, they've lost all the bone, but with toothbrushing and with annual cleanings, you know, professional cleanings or what I'll call like a cohat. So a full assessment under anesthesia, we can keep the teeth that are there as healthy as possible. So I think just spending the time and talking to owners is a huge part of dentistry and oral surgery. Yeah, I think it's pretty um, important, like what Dr. Amy said. So thank you so much for your answer, Doctor. Now I will pass on to JJ for the next question. So for the next question, mind to tell us one or two interesting cases that you have ever encountered? Oh my gosh, how do I pick? Um, <laughs> um, oh, wow. There's a lot. So I think I'll focus on um, more dentistry related cases. So one of my um, favorite cases is from many, many years ago. This was when I was a family veterinarian. So this is well before I was a dentist. Um, and I worked in a busy practice where we had full days of surgery. So um, I was had a little Pomeranian scheduled to be neutered by me, but I hadn't seen him for his puppy vaccines. Um, it just worked out that the day that I was on surgery was the best day for the owners. So this little cutie, Perot, uh, I still talk to his owners. Um, so he was scheduled to see me and I was reading the um, notes. It was like unable to look in the mouth. And I was like, no way. And so when he came in, I wanted to do my pre-surgical exam. And so when he came in, lo and behold, I tried to lift that lip. And as soon as I went near his mouth, he was like, no way, clenching things closed. He was like alligator rolling, like he was not having it. So I was like, okay, like I'm normally pretty good at looking in mouths, right? I love mouths. But I was like, okay, fine. We'll get a look when he's under. Um, so the rest of his exam was normal. So we went ahead with sedating him. And once he was under anesthesia, I found out why he wouldn't let anyone touch his mouth is he had a painful malocclusion. So his lower canines um, were what we call lingoverted or often called base narrow. And so his lower canines were hitting the roof of his mouth. And so why we thought he was just, you know, maybe not the nicest dog. It was actually because his mouth was sore and he didn't want anyone to touch it. And so once he was under anesthesia for his neuter, I was able to get a better look in the mouth. Um, and so I called the owners and said, listen, I found this problem. Like we have some options and they were just feeling kind of overwhelmed because this was new information. So I said, what we'll do, like, we'll just do the neuter and then I'll take a bunch of pictures. And then when you come pick them up, I'll talk to you about what I found and we'll talk about options. 
And so we talked about a couple different options about how to treat this malocclusion. Um, and ultimately, because referral to a dentist wasn't an option, um, I ended up removing some teeth. And, and how it worked out where the malocclusion was, I could keep the canines, but removing some incisors that removed the what we call traumatic contact or malocclusion. Um, and in talking with them, I was like, yeah, like he really doesn't like have his mouth touched. And they're like, yeah, like he's never wanted us in there. Um, and so then I started asking more questions and it turned out that he was a picky eater. So he didn't eat his whole meal in one sitting. He would like go and eat a few kibbles and go and do stuff and then come back. And so long story short, once he healed up from his neuter, we had him come back in. I did the surgery. I removed some teeth and, and basically kind of did what we call an alveolar plasty. So I removed a little bit of bone just so the canine wouldn't be hitting anymore. And when they came back for the two-week recheck, I just wanted to make sure everything was healing. One, I actually could look in his mouth awake without him fighting me. And two, he was no longer a picky eater. So this was a case where the dog was otherwise healthy. He wasn't showing any signs of oral pain um, that we would expect, right? Like he was still eating, he was still playing, but he wouldn't let me look in his mouth awake and he was a picky eater. And so these very subtle things that don't scream oral pain um, can actually be cues you know like so for say a dog sometimes you'll hear their head shy so they won't let you near their face a lot of times and not always a lot of times there's something going on in that mouth that's painful and they just don't want it to be touched so he was um a wonderful dog that i ended up caring for for a full three years um before i left to do um my residency um and because we we're able to find the problem and treat the problem and the owner saw such an improvement um in his demeanor they saw the value in his oral care and so they were really committed to brushing every day and then I would see him for his vaccines and they'd be like okay it's about time for his annual cleaning and we get that scheduled and a month or so later he'd come in and he even as a small palm um, didn't have any extractions beyond those initial ones for many years because we were able to stay on top of um, his oral health so he's um, he's a pup that's close to my heart he was very early in my career while I was still learning and, you know, that kind of thing. And just to see how big of a improvement and change um, that we can make by catching these subtle things was, was really cool. All right. Thank you. That, that sounds very cool. For me, I think uh, just because the dog doesn't show any signs of pain doesn't mean that uh, they're not having any disease related to them. Yeah, yeah. One of my other cases just very quickly was um, an older lab that I saw. And, you know, they were like, she's doing great. You know, she's slowing down a little bit, but she's like seven or eight. So she's getting a bit older. And I was like, okay, like, I mean, she is older, but, you know, I always worry when they say they're slowing down. And so then when I got to my oral exam, I found significant calculus and gingival recession. And I said, you know what, like, concerned about this area, I kind of showed them, you know, this isn't normal. Um, and fortunately, they took my recommendation um and she came in and sure enough those molars were really diseased and needed to be extracted and again at that two-week recheck to make sure everything was healing they were like she's not slowed down at all <laughs> she's back to running around like she was three years ago so it's hard because yes we can you know humans dogs cats can slow down as we get older but we also can get not that age is a disease, but we can get, especially with periodontal disease, it's a progressive disease. So if we don't treat it early, it's only going to get worse. And so sometimes we, you know, see a dog or cat that's slowing down and we think it's age, but it, it actually could be periodontal disease. And so that dog got, you know, it's pep and it stepped back and was behaving, you know, more like a six-year-old dog instead of a nine-year-old dog and the owners were ecstatic so again just like you were saying is they're not showing outward signs that they're uncomfortable because it's so slow it's like a slow progression and so oftentimes we even at own as owners the most in you know intuitive and intent owners we don't see a change because it's so slow and gradual that we see the change once we remove that i think that the for the next question i will pass to jaya okay Okay, thank you, JJ. So before we wrap up the session, uh, what will be a take-home message that doctor would like to give our listeners, especially since most of our listeners are 
among veterinarians, students, and also the public? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, the number one thing is oral health is important. Um, so, you know, you'll hear some people say it's like the gateway to the whole body, right? So if we have infection in our oral cavity, um, in our teeth, that can spread throughout the body. It can also be very uncomfortable and the signs of disease can be quite subtle. So um, I think it's important us as veterinary professionals to not shy away from having that conversation um, when we find disease um, and, and getting comfortable talking, you know, with owners that maybe don't believe, right? Like we will meet some pet parents that are like, no, they're great. Um, but what you're seeing is not great. Um, and so just being comfortable to talk to owners um, and the same with, you know, owners and pet parents, you know, if you have, you know, concerns, uh, oftentimes I'll hear owners talk about, yeah, their breath, breath is really bad, but like they're old, that's normal or whatever. And I will always say bad breath is never normal. So what you're smelling is disease. So if you are smelling bad breath, or maybe now that you've listened, you're watching your pet eat and they're chewing on one side, and not the other. Those are all indications that there could be disease that your pet's going to benefit um, from seeing a vet and potentially having a tooth or couple removed. Other thing that I'll ch share with, you know, veterinarians, students, technicians, owners is that while we want to save teeth, I'll always tell anyone that will listen is that as a dentist, I want to save teeth, I want to keep those teeth in there. However, I would much rather have a pet with few or no teeth at all and be comfortable. And so I think that sometimes that is the concern as a lot of owners can't imagine themselves without teeth. So they can't imagine their pets without teeth. So then when we're like, they need multiple teeth taken out, they're just like, no way, you know, my pet is going to be unhappy. And if, especially if they're not seeing signs that there's pain. So just spending that time to basically say, listen, no, none of us actually want to take your pet's teeth out. We want them to keep them. But I would rather take out diseased teeth and know that they're comfortable um, than leave teeth that they're going to be uncomfortable with. And while, you know, teeth are important, there's lots of pets out there, um, my dog nephew included, who have no teeth at all, and he's actually better off. He was, um, he's another example of a pet that was relinquished to a rescue, and he was really in rough shape, and they thought he was like 15. He was so rough shape, and I took out all of his teeth, and within a couple of weeks, he was running around like a, like, I swear, he's maybe 10 at most. So. Um, and he doesn't care. His tongue hangs out a little bit. He's cute as a button. He eats no problem. He plays. Um, so I think just knowing that while we want to always save teeth, there are going to be teeth that are too diseased and it's not going to benefit your pet. It actually is going to be, be a hindrance to their comfort and their health to keep those teeth. And so I think it's important for us as veterinary professionals is to make sure that we communicate that with owners and hopefully owners can hear us saying that, you know, we don't want to take out teeth. It's a a lot of work. Um, we want your pet to keep their teeth. And at the same time, we'd rather them be a few teeth lighter or even have no teeth at all, but be comfortable. All right, doctor, thank you so much for the message. It's really helpful for all of us. And I guess that is time to wrap up our session for today. So thank you so much, Dr. Amy for sharing your experience with us today and the knowledge that we gained today is extremely valuable. So that is all folks for our third podcast episode of season two. It truly was an interesting topic we had today as we got to know more about veterinary dentistry. To summarize today's session, veterinary dentistry is an intriguing area to pursue especially given the lack of awareness and demand in our country, which is Malaysia. We hope that this podcast session will open our listeners' eyes and encourage fellow veterinary students to choose dentistry as their area to further on. We thank you again, Dr. Amy Thompson, for taking the time to talk to us about this topic today. For our listeners, thank you for tuning in on our podcast episode once again. And thank you to our team for making this podcast possible. Have a good day, everyone, and stay safe.